really have to do too much to it at this point. <coughs> we could actually mess around with some other edges, cut some more edges in, which in this case I'm actually adding some in. Um, I could, if I wanted to, say, select the edges that I just made and pull those in and make it kind of a funky, jaggedy looking base if I wanted to. One of those ones that has like the swoops going around it, like, I can't think of the term. But I decided not to do that. I decided instead that I was going to select just the very top loops and push down and give it kind of a cool top, kind of a fancier top to it instead of just your boring circular top. Kind of still trying to adjust how I want it to look. You can add bevels in anywhere that you want a harder edge. And we could keep beveling to add in little details here and there, but <clears throat> in this case I kind of liked exactly where it kind of stopped, so that's how I left it. And now we're looking at what the poly count is. That is the poly count once you refine. So if you're ever not sure when you're subdivided and some dividing and undoing and undoing how high the poly is, you just look right up there and that'll tell you when you refine this so that you get your final polygons. It'll tell you how many polys basically that you're using. And if you look here, I'm kind of flipping through to see you know, how many polys I can get away with to get the look that I want. I could have left it lower, but it would have been a little lumpy. I have a thing about that. I don't like lumpy stuff. I'd rather actually put the extra poly in and have it not lumpy. Now we're going to do a little bit of fixing. Because on the bottom here, you'll see there's a whole bunch of points all coming into one polygon, which is considered to be an n-gon. And while Down Studio and Poser can both handle them, they don't always handle them well. And if you can get rid of them, which in this case we can, then you should. And all I'm doing is basically clicking a point and then clicking the point across from it and then hitting X. Then I selected the lines through the middle and hit X to get a line going through there and then went back to point mode and connected those. So it's going to be point mode, click, click, X, click, click, X, <laughs> go in the middle, click, click, X, go to edge mode, click across those, X, go back to point, click, click, X, <laughs> click, click, X. See, those little shortcut keys are so handy. Okay, that gets rid of our end gone, and actually it made everything nice and quadded. So there's no triangles or anything. Kind of decent shape, so it worked out nice. If we wanted, we could splice in some weird little edges here or there. And kind of change the shape a little bit and so we can harden that edge a little bit more or we could actually add in a little bit of a design right on the corners if we kind of sliced in a couple tries I decided against that though so I just undid it um, at this point I kind of like where I'm at I think ignore the fact that I messed up again though At this point, before I ever finalize anything, so I still have this little low poly cage. I, I have something that's easy to work with, which this is because there's not a ton of points and a ton of edges. I usually save one version of whatever I make like this, and then I go to file and save as again, and then save it again, usually with an F or something that says finalized at the end. and then save it again, and then actually refine the mesh. That way, if I need to go all the way back, I haven't lost my ability to work with it simplistically. So now we've got it all refined. 
And this is what our actual polygons look like going through there. That's what all that subdividing did was added on in all those polygons. Now we can actually edit it further. So in this case, I'm going to grab a couple edges and pull some down. Grab some edges, pull them up. Grab some more edges in a minute here and kind of do it again because I decided that I wanted the inside to kind of be a little fancier. And just adds character to it. Not necessarily necessary, but it does show you like once you refine, your modeling may not be over. Now the big bummer is if you have to go all the way back to the other file, then obviously you lose all of this and all of the refining stuff you would have to do over again when you finalize your changes. Hopefully that makes sense. So if I go back to the vase before I finalized it and had to make any changes, then I would have to save a new version of the refined vase and then redo all these changes I just made. <clears throat> now some people are going to ask why I just hit face and select all and then said to save the OBJ. I don't know about anybody else, but I have an odd, odd, odd little bug with my silo that could be something with my graphics card, my computer that it doesn't like, I don't know. But on and off, if I just click on the OBJ, click on the object and then save it as an OBJ, well click on the object in the scene and save it as an OBJ rather, um, not always does it save anything. Like sometimes it actually saves a blank file and I haven't figured out why. The only way I can avoid doing that is if I go into face mode and select all the faces and then save it out that way. Then it definitely does not save a blank file and it actually saves the OBJ right. So that's why I did that. Now we're going to go into UV Mapper and we're going to open up our vase and kind of take a look at it in there. I have Pro. If you have Classic, it's going to look a little different than this. If you have the money to invest in a mapping program, UV Mapper Pro is decent. I think that's somewhere around like $70, I do believe, when I bought it. It's been years ago now, actually. Um, for an object like this, though, as you're going to see, UV Mapper Classic or Pro isn't really going to do such a hot job on it. Um, you could get it to work, but it's going to take a tremendously long time to do because you're going to have to kind of pull stuff apart and then kind of weld it and seam it back together on your own. I would advise with a shape like this to actually use either silos mapping or use um, a program called UV Layout, which I personally absolutely love and can't say enough wonderful things about. And if I had to pick between the two, I'd totally go for UV Layout. Although UV Layout for the hobby license, I think is like a hundred bucks. And for the professional one, which I totally recommend if you can afford it, I think it's like right around three somewhere, $300. But that's one of those things I don't leave home without. <laughs> I, I like my UV layout, but in this case, um, this is me trying the different mapping to show you the problems. Like with this, you're going to get stretching down two of the sides. Now, if for some reason you're just using a regular texture on this, which to be honest, for a vase, you can get away with a diffuse color and some gloss. So if they're stretching in the mapping, it doesn't matter because you're not physically mapping it. Like you're not actually putting a physical texture like wood or something to it where that stretching would be horrible. You can actually get away with just doing a planar map or something like that. If though you say wanted to make a texture for this with little painted flowers on it or anything like that then none of these maps are going to work out right. And you're going to see they're just making a mess. The maps aren't even. They don't look good. Some of the stuff's squinchy. Some of it's stretchy. No matter how we adjust it or which one we pick, every single one is going to have a problem. If you just don't 
understand silos mapping because it is a little odd, actually. Um, and you really are just more comfortable in UV layout. You could use it, but it's hard.